Howdy, welcome to Moonlight Less Than Moonlight. I'm Justin, and today we'll be talking about Yi Sung's Morning, as translated by Michael Joseph Walsh and Jay Kim, and published on Guernica's website on January 24th of this year. Yi Sung will get to shortly. First, to give proper credit to the translators, Michael Joseph Walsh is, in his own words, a Korean American poet and translator. He is co-editor of Apartment Poetry, and his work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Brooklyn Rail, Diagram, Reginald, Folder, Fence, Jubilat, and elsewhere. He lives in Denver. Jay Kim, in his own words, is a writer from South Korea and a translator of Korean and Japanese literature. He lives in St. Louis and has served as junior writer-in-residence at Washington University in St. Louis, where he is currently part of the International Writers Program. His short story, South of Here, was published in Noon earlier this year. His translation, Roommate, Woman, was the winner of the inaugural Words Without Borders Poems in Translation Contest, judged by Monica de la Torre, and appears in Poets.org and the Poem a Day series by American Academy of Poets. This is a short one this week, so I'll look forward to you being back soon. Well, that was quick, huh? Before we talk about this poem, I want to get a well-rounded picture of Yi Sung, his time, and his place. It's possible to appreciate mourning in the abstract space of literature. If you did, I'm glad, and if you want to skip straight to the poem, click the timestamp below. But we can only make more exciting our experience of the poem by complicating it with a broader sense of where Yi Sung and the world was situated. To do that, we'll be taking a tiny detour through roughly 300 years of some East Asian history. I'm not a historian, keep in mind, so as usual, see the description for sources. A quick content warning for sexual violence and... Let's dive in. For nearly 200 years, between 1417 and 1615, Japan was embroiled in a series of internal conflicts between its largest political leaders. Near the end of this series of civil wars and what has now been called the Sengoku period, fans of the Samurai Warriors games will recognize the names, the daimyos, or feudal landowners, were semi-united under Hideyoshi Toyotomi, who, in 1592, would attempt to build power by conquering what was then Ming Dynasty China. In order to do so, Hideyoshi would try to conquer the, by that point, two-century-old Choson Dynasty in Korea. The combined military of Ming China and its vassal state kept Hideyoshi at bay until his death in 1598. Since his only living heir, Hideyori, was five, a regency council was formed. Two years later, after some internal conflicts proved the past peace to be fragile, Two of the former region's militaries would fight at Sakikahara. Ieyasu Tokugawa would defeat Mitsunari Ishida and thus establish the Tokugawa shogunate. As the shogunate passed from Ieyasu to his son Hidetada and from Hidetada to his son Iemitsu, a sturdiness began to be established. This also included, however, an increasing amount of Christian missionaries and merchants from the empire-building Dutch and Portuguese empires, among others. Following in his father and grandfather's footsteps, Although with more finality, Iemitsu would sign the Edict of 1635. In order to consolidate power with the shogunate at the center, the shogunate would functionally close Japan off from these foreign influences. This would be called Sakoku. Around this time, China would experience its own crisis, with the 276-year-old Ming Dynasty collapsing under internal economic pressure and military conflict with the church and people, whose geographical ancestors would later be known as the Manchu as in Manchuria. Thus rose the Qing Empire. According to an unpublished doctoral thesis by Si Minghua, this transition of power in China marks a break within Korean history. Because of the Ming Dynasty's assistance defending Korea against Hideyoshi Toyotomi's military, the Choson Dynasty would, quote, render the Ming as an irreplaceable and unsurpassable model, end quote, for governance, and is the reason why, quote, the downfall of the Ming broke the ideological connection between China and Choson Korea, end quote. The tributary dynamic would be re-established after Qing China invaded Choson Korea, but the dynamic wouldn't be the same. Fast forward two centuries, perhaps the symbolic moment of Western imperial power's relationship to East Asia is Commodore Perry forcing open Japan with a fleet of American warships between 1853 and 1854. This is typically considered the beginning of a period in Japanese history called Bakumatsu, literally, the end of the shogunate, as the rise of trading would bring with it wealth and investments that moved power away from the declining Tokugawa shogunate and towards the major restoration in 1868. The emperor returned to power 
Japan sought development through trade with the West and empire building. Meanwhile in Korea, in 1868, a German merchant and French priest tried to steal the bones of the king's father in an attempt to blackmail him for trade agreements. That literal invasion of body snatchers failed. However, it's just one of several incidents involving Westerners extorting the still Choson dynasty ruled Korea. This included an 1866 incident where a U.S. merchant ship raided Riverside Korean settlements and a short-lived occupation of Korean land by the American military in 1871. Hong Sun Dae Gan, the Korean king at the time, decided to enter Korea into its own period of isolation like Japan before it. From this strict isolationism came the nickname that we still hear today for North Korea, the Hermit Kingdom. This wouldn't last very long. In 1876, just as America had done to it via Commodore Perry, and as Hideyoshi Toyotomi tried to do centuries before, Japan would use force to leverage power over Korea, in this case, to enter into an unequal trade agreement called the Treaty of Kanghua. In 1895, with the defeat of Qing China in the First Sino-Japanese War, Korea was cut off from its power broker, and the power of the Choson dynasty began to wane. In the same year, Korea's Queen Min would be assassinated. And two years later, her widower, the son of Hong Sun Daewon Gun, King Gojong, declared Korea an independent empire and began modest, modernizing reforms. After Japan's victory in the Russo Japanese War in 1905, though, Korea became a protectorate, essentially a colony of Japan. The Yulsa Treaty is still a controversial memory, as it was never signed by the emperor himself, but by certain elites who aided Japan in colonizing Korea. This is so controversial that South Korea signed into law the seizure of properties and assets from the descendants of the quote-unquote five Yulsa traders in 2005, as well as other collaborators with Japan during the colonial period. There's a derogatory word in the Korean language that consolidates an anti-Japanese sentiment, but I will not be saying it since I don't know how severe or hurtful it is, but I've linked the Wikipedia page for it below because it has an interesting history. As already foreshadowed, neither the Korean Empire nor the Choson Dynasty had much time left. Emperor Gojong sent three secret emissaries to The Hague to contest the validity of the Yulsa Treaty, but they were denied entry. In retaliation, Japan forced Gojong to abdicate the throne to his son Sunjong. Three years later, in 1910, Japan would formally annex Korea and end the Choson Dynasty. It had already lasted five centuries, and the year of its death would be the same year Kim Hae-young would be born in Seoul. His parents would give him over to his uncle in 1912, since his uncle was better able to give Hae-young opportunities, being a bureaucrat in the Japanese colonial government. He'd take over that position from his uncle after graduating as one of only two Koreans in his class, and would retire in his early 20s because of his tuberculosis. In April 1937, that tuberculosis would kill him, likely exacerbated by the conditions of the Japanese prison he was sent to for being an quote-unquote unruly Korean, a vague legal term whose ambiguity mirrors the way loitering and resisting arrest grants excess of authority to police today. Eight months later, Japan would invade Nanjing, killing and raping hundreds of thousands while maintaining the sex-slave system of comfort women largely obtained from Korea and China. At the time of his death, at the age of 26, and to us today, He's known as Isung, sometimes the Rambo of Korea, and the author of today's poem. A final note before the poem. There are a lot of difficulties in reading and translation. Words lose weight or cultural meaning, pejoratives for example. Rhyme and rhythm are impossible to duplicate exactly. References to other works can be lost. But one of the benefits of reading work and translation, I find, is that you don't come into the work with built-in cultural baggage. William Winouse writes, for instance, that Isung is, quote, typically read in rigidly nationalistic terms as a modernist who embodies a distinctly Korean spirit of anti-Japanese colonial resistance, end quote. Winouse notes a few problems with this, up to and including, which Korea? How does a man who actively enjoyed the colonizer's privileges, wealth from, and employment in the colonial bureaucracy, represent anti-Japanese colonial resistance? How can a man who said of rural Koreans in Songshan, quote, what difference is there between them and corpses? Corpses know how to eat and sleep, end quote, represent them. If he did represent them, 
why did he write more than half of his poems in Japanese? Because I'm coming from the outside, and probably you are too, and if you're not, I'm glad to have you here either way, it's easier to see the contradictions between Isung and this nationalist ideal. In fact, it's better to understand his self-image as, Winhouse writes, a resident of cosmopolitan Seoul rather than a Korean per se, and as someone whose aspirations were visiting Tokyo and becoming a respected author alongside his companions in the Korean literary collective, The Group of Nine, described by Renaus as having an, quote, art for art's sake mentality and concern for a pure, non-ideological literature, end quote. It's better, that's to say, to see his writing as formed by a global modernism, including the likes of the American-British T.S. Eliot, Japanese Chika Sagawa, and Mexican Octavio Paz. We won't go too much into that here, but it's important to think about going into our poem, Morning. Isung and his works are deeply shaped by history, and while we can't reduce his poetry purely to history, we can't ignore his relationship to the time and place in which he lived and thought. Fittingly, Morning begins with the image of black air that's bad for the lungs to drink. This evokes factories and smokestacks, which makes sense for an industrializing soul, and is pointed to by the next sentence, in the walls of the lungs sits soot. There's an ironic contrast between the titles evoking vision, cleanliness, maybe something pastoral and green, and this diseased and dark world of modernity. It's important to note that it's not a traditionalist's critique of modernity, or a conservative's longing for the past, not even an aggressive embrace of modernity's violence a la Baudelaire, but a sinking into defeat. There is so much of this night that cycles through him, mirroring the respiratory cycle, carry, bring, forget. But this night, the consequence of human actions in the form of pollution, also mirrors natural processes. Instead of breathing, though, it mirrors the passing of time itself. There is no autonomy here. The byproduct of human action is all that remains in the world, and it passes through the body just as smog makes the darkness of night. This absorptive quality of people is emphasized in how once morning arrives, even in the lungs the morning switches on. The even emphasizes the omnipresence of the natural order, or whatever becomes the natural order. In this case, the soot and black air take the place of reality and their absence. The night replaced by morning makes the speaker look around for anything missing. This idea of worry being habit, and the poem beginning with a specific worry, doubly naturalizes the modern condition. In a cyclical fashion, the change from the traditional world to the modern world creates the conditions of panic until modernity naturalizes itself, after which its absence is what induces panic, regardless of how harmful or helpful it actually is. This cycle is the central tension of mourning. What is made and what precedes making gives a paranoid, fractured sense to perception. Much like with Eliot's unreal city of the wasteland, there's an absurd undeniability to it. One could even read this as a thesis on history, that this violence is man-made and natural to man, and that history embodies this habit of violence. One might look at the history of Japan's relationship to China and Korea. I'm reminded of the 20th century Romanian philosophical pessimist Emil Cioran's description of the source of success for young nations as, quote, savagery, since what counts for them is not their dreams, but their energy, end quote. There's the same sense that this physical terrain called the nation, embodied in a generic smokestack-filled world in mourning, merely produces and reproduces a deterioration in humanity. Much like energy, and much unlike dreams, habit is thoughtless and continues until an external force resists it. This doesn't exist for the speaker of mourning, though. All they see is an extravagant book with pages torn out. Now is a perfect time to note that, while there's a possible reading of this that says it's a critique of censorship under the colonial regime, or censorship generally, I'm not convinced of this. Primarily because Wenaus, quoting Kyung Moon Huang, notes how censorship was so light that newspapers, quote, included reports about the anti-Japanese Korean guerrilla groups operating in Manchuria, end quote. Combined with Isung's Japanophilia, it's unlikely he would use it as raw material for this poem. 
rather, for the speaker, I see the torn out pages as another sign of human-caused imperfection, with the extravagant pointing us to the pessimistic heart of the poem. It suggests that human-made change is excessive, unnecessary, and yet is perpetuated regardless. Worse off, extravagance is presumably enjoyed despite its fragility. The speaker does own this book, after all. It's art for art's sake. Yet even worse, and here's the kicker, we can still know how it ends even with the pages torn out. The description of the conclusion as restless, that the conclusion is the morning sun, invites us to realize that everything points to this inevitability of return, this energy. There's an inescapability that becomes palpable in the last sentence. As if that night without a nose will never come. Now a paper could be written about what the nose signifies in Isun from what I've read of his wider work. If you want to try to follow your nose to more of his work, look into the Columbia Anthology of Modern Korean Poetry, edited by David R. McCann, and a book of his selected works that will be out from Wave Press in September. Without deferring to other poems, however, we can work out why he chose the nose. The nose has three relevant values here. One, it brings the black air and soot to the lungs. Two, smell is our most powerful sense, and is tied directly to our limbic system, which, in Gloria Rodriguez Gill's words, deals with the instinctive or automatic behaviors and has little, if anything, to do with conscious thought or will. The absence of will symbolized by the existence of the nose, of memories evoked by smell, plays well into the inescapable cycle of time the speaker engages with in the poem. We can even trace this back to Japanese stereotypes of Koreans during the colonial period. One Japanese travelogue of the time, which Tade Henry quotes in Sanitizing Empire, says that, quote, when it comes to sanitation and sickness, they are loose in the extreme. Indeed, to put it in the worst terms, one could even say they are closer to beasts than animals, end quote. It's unclear what Isung's self-image was, but there's a compelling case to be made tying his focus on the nose to these racial stereotypes. Lastly, though, and this may have limited application with a known Korean, in English we have a lot of nose-based idioms, win by the nose, turn your nose up at, take it on the nose, all of which point to the outgoing nature of the nose. It's always ahead of us, leading, pointing, and taking blows before we do. This forward-mindedness belies the absolute inability of forward motion to the speaker, hence why the night without a nose will never come. There's no illusion of moving beyond the smokestacks, no type of freedom, and literature itself comes to embody this frivolous hopelessness. So that's some thoughts on Isung's Morning, as translated by Michael Joseph Walsh and Jake Kim, and published on Guernica's website on January 24th of this year. This was a long one, and I very much know that, so thank you for sticking around. I'd love to hear from you if you had any thoughts on this one. Maybe you just want to correct me on my history or my pronunciation. Either way, I'm excited to hear from you. While you're down there, like and subscribe if you like this video, and check out my sources if you want to look into the history of East Asia and Isung more. Until next time, thanks for sticking around.